bienvenue au podcast Quantum. Donc, à partir de cette semaine, j'ai décidé de faire des entrevues aussi par Skype, euh, pour, euh, puis en anglais aussi, pour aller chercher d'autres informations parce que des fois, c'est un petit peu compliqué, euh, puis c'est un petit peu dur aussi avec le, le, le temps d'aller voir du monde ou que le monde se déplace pour les podcasts. Donc, on va en faire un petit peu plus par Skype. Donc, euh, ce podcast, c'est avec Alan Cress, IFBB Pro. C'est un coach euh, aux États-Unis. Il a coaché un paquet de monde au niveau euh, plus sportif, mais depuis une couple d'années, il spécialise vraiment en préparation physique, en compétition. Donc, euh, lui-même, il, euh, il est pro IFBB en men's euh, classic bodybuilding. Et, euh, et c'est ça, fait qu'on a parlé de programmation, de périodisation, de nutrition, euh, de l'importance de la santé, donc vraiment un talk euh, super bon. Euh, soyez indulgents, c'est en anglais, donc euh, puis j'étais un petit peu stressé, fait que mon anglais, des fois, j'ai de la misère un peu. Euh, mais c'est ça, fait que c'est en anglais. Euh, euh, donc c'est ça, fait que, euh, il va y avoir d'autres domaines qui vont s'en venir en anglais aussi euh, pour vous apporter le plus d'informations possible. Donc euh, c'est donc ça, fait que sur ça je vous souhaite une excellente écoute et si vous appréciez les podcasts, n'oubliez pas de faire un 5 étoiles sur iTunes, faire un like, vous abonner, vous abonner sur la chaîne YouTube et sur ça je vous souhaite une bonne écoute. Mm. Can you first talk about uh, your background in uh, like coaching well, also in bodybuilding and all sure. the, your years of... Uh... Sure. Yeah, so I, um, I've been doing this for a long time, so uh, I'm currently 42. So I started my whole journey in the fitness world, uh, competing and whatnot, when I was 17. Um, that's when I did my first bodybuilding competition as a teen, uh, and I won my class. Um, and then I uh, started college. Um, I went to the University of Kentucky, um, and then I graduated there uh, with a degree in kinesiology. Um, I did background in, in uh, physical therapy. Um, and I started coaching slash training one-on-one -on -one, um, while I was in college. Um, and then I, I, I was lucky enough to, you know, in this industry, sometimes it's just like the right place at the right time, getting good connections. Um, and I started training um, an NBA athlete. You know, he kind of gave me a trial run Um, uh, seeing how I would do with him, obviously, during his off-season, and we clicked really well. Um, so I started coaching him, and obviously that led to more uh, clients coming in, obviously because of referrals from him, seeing me training him. So, like, my actual beginning in this industry was, you know, coaching more athletes, like in sports. You know, I had collegiate football players, NBA players, uh, swimmers, uh, karate, some Olympic athletes. Uh, so that was actually my first go around as coaching. It wasn't in physique development uh, per se. I just did that kind of as a, a personal thing that I enjoyed doing because uh, I wasn't an elite athlete. I played basketball and stuff, but you know, that <laughs> I wasn't going to be a professional in that aspect by any means. Um, so I started out in that endeavor, graduated from college, um, training nothing purely athletes and then a lot, some general population one-on-one uh, -on -one at my gym. Uh, and then I started competing more and more in bodybuilding. And then that kind of caught the attention of others. Um, and they asked if I coached, you know, doing that. And then I started taking them on as well. Um, and then obviously my passion for that developed more and more and more. So, you know, I didn't transit. I still coach some athletes. It's just dominantly now is kind of lifestyle and better. So that's my two, you know, main sources um, of clientele right now or demographics. Um, as far, and then my background too, like I've competed, been competing in, you know, bodybuilding for 25 years now, been coaching for 20. Um, but I've also been a competitive power lifter. I did that for about four years, um, competing with like some of the big names, like with Dave Tate and, you know, with Louis Simmons and all those guys from up there on west side um, i didn't train at west side but i've trained with the guys before um so that was a nice endeavor to kind of go alongside with bodybuilding obviously taking what i could from them knowledge wise and training wise because there's always a crossover that you can apply uh between the two fields whether it's physique development and or strength based stuff um so it was a good learning experience um also learning that you really can't train for both at the same time Doing powerlifting and bodybuilding is just your body cannot handle it. Um, I did it, so I did it for four years, and um, I did decent. 
but my structure, uh, nervous system and everything just is not built to be a, a one rep max kind of guy. Um, I just don't do that well with it. I mean, I joint aches and pains and just, you know, kind of hurting all over. So I was like, did that. I had fun with it, but, you know, put it to the side and started focusing back on physique development and just for me competitively wanting to take it, you know, to that next level. Um, so that's kind of my journey in a scope. And obviously like now um, I, you know, finally got my pro card and all that stuff personally. Um, business is great now with just, you know, the lifestyle clients and um, uh, the, the competitors. And then also now we're doing, you know, seminars, which, you know, you've attended one, but we've developed those even more. Um, so, we're, you know, we're planning actually planning to do a tour around Europe later this year. And then hopefully next year in uh, Australia um, as well. Um, then I've been fortunate enough, obviously, you know, uh, with in-one training and CAS and them, um, we're good friends. And um, I feel I've been a part of that. And then I've helped CAS sometimes uh, doing their practicals. And, you know, I go out there, I'll be out there in August to, with a programming course for them. Um, so a lot of great things, you know, developing at this point in time, just crazy busy with all that stuff. Um, but it's all good. I mean, I love every minute of it, uh, for sure. And are you still competing uh, this year or in the next year? Uh, definitely not this year. Um, definitely. Uh, I, I want. I never want to say 100% definitely, just because things get crazy. I thought I was going to this year, but um, with the schedule and the, the traveling, like traveling around the U.S. is not a big deal. But when you start doing international and all that stuff, that's just a whole nother. You just don't know what to expect. Uh, but I also had some gut issues that I dealt with, which put me on hold with progress, you know, making pro progress the way I wanted to. I had a knee uh, injury um, and then and my adductor strain. So I've had, you know, little things that just popped up that w I wasn't expecting. So that kind of put that on the back burner because I'm not going to compete you know, having to go through these things and my mentality as an athlete, I need to be on point and be able to train the way I want to train, eat the way I want to eat. And, you know, because of the gut stuff and all that I went through, I couldn't do all that. So as an athlete mentally, for me to, to step on stage, I mean, could I? Sure. But I would be second guessing myself. Like, you know, I, I wasn't my best because I couldn't do the things I needed to do. So I've taken that step back being like, I would tell a client, you know, take the step back, do what you need to do improve get better and then step on the stage you know hopefully next year um but mm -hmm. the stage isn't going anywhere the unfortunate thing is i am getting up there in age <laughs> so my window of opportunity is getting a little smaller um just because it's the reality right i mean we can't just keep progressing especially when you're advanced and you've been doing it for 20 some years i'm looking for an increase of like five percent at this point and just refinement um but you know we'll just we'll toss things up in the air and see what happens can you talk a little bit about your program design metho methodology and your periodization methodology also sure because uh, that's kind of cool uh, what you do yeah uh and it's funny right because especially when it comes to like physique development um that you really don't hear periodization and people utilizing that it's more, you hear periodization more so in athletic realms with you know sports mm -hmm with the specific seasons with basketball and football and whatever, you know, periodization has been around forever. It's not like it's some brand new con concept, but as with bodybuilding and physique development stuff, they just have their own way of thinking and think that it should be separate from that. You know, like the big thing with bodybuilding for a lot of people, not everybody is always progressive overload. They just love that form of like, just put more weight on the bar and, that's really kind of the simplification of what you need to be doing to get, uh, you know, bigger and improve to an extent. Obviously that's true. You do need to get stronger at some point, but there's also more ways to progressively overload yourself besides just putting weight on a bar. There's different types of methods and strategies that you can use for progressive overload. And people are overlooking those. Um, they think that if you're not putting weight on the bar, you're not going to grow new tissue. But the body just understands stress that you're putting on it, right? It, it doesn't care the number that's on the bar that you're putting in your hands. So it's the amount of tension you can put on it, the amount of stress you can put the tissue under. 
um, and just you know modifying those things. So like you can you can modify your rest periods, you can modify your tempos, um, all kinds of factors to come into play uh, and improve the density of the workout. That's progressively overloading your system, right? And it has nothing to do with just the load on the bar. So when it comes to periodizing training, that's going to come down to obviously the ultimate goal. Like okay, what is our primary goal? You know, if you're a competitor, it's hypertrophy, right? I mean, you're trying to build as much muscle tissue as you can possibly build. So for the majority of your training year, yes, you're going to spend most of your tra time training in that type of stimulus to where it's just, you know, let's just push hypertrophy. Now understand that hypertrophy, there's a lot of subcategories underneath hypertrophy. It's not just hypertrophy and, you know, it's train eight to 12 reps and that's the be all end all. That's obviously part of it, but it's just an oversimplification of what's truly out there because you can kind of i want to say bias certain types of stimulus there's always going to be some overlap and i think that's the argument now is like you can't just train for metabolic you just can't train for hypertrophy or just strength because you'll get some adaptation from the other types of things yes but you can still put a greater percentage and bias toward one type of training so the, the benefits of that so like say that we're periodizing for a competitor and we're in the off season and our goal is obviously to grow as much tissue as possible. We're in a hypertrophy type based phase. Now that could be, are we biasing more mechanical damage type, you know, trauma to the tissue? Are we going a little bit more volume based with more tension? Um, are we incorporating a little bit of metabolic stress in there with that? Um, you know, there's, there's little, those little umbrellas that come down with, the hypertrophy. So depending on what you're doing in that scope is going to dictate how you periodize things. So for example, you know, say we're doing a lot of functional type hypertrophy where it's more mechanical damage, like you're spending like more time in that stretch position, you know, the lengthening of the fibers where you're going to create a lot more mechanical damage. And that honestly is, is like your best range in the contractile range to accrue damage and cause that adaptive response to your body needs to grow you know it needs to get stronger um but it's very damaging right so that's a lot of inflammation you're creating in the body so you can only do that for so long and then your body as it does with everything it it kind of down regulates those signals right and to get more out of it typically you have to kind of do more and more and more so this is where kind of periodization will come in so you're doing that for X amount of time, and then we kind of get away from that specific type of stimulus, get a, like almost like a complete 180, allow those um, genes and everything to kind of resensitize, get away from it, and then you can jump right back into it and let's continue to work, you know, towards hypertrophy. Um, so it's like periodization is like trying to keep your body as sensitive as possible for your ultimate goal, right? So we want a majority of the time be trained for hypertrophy. But again, your body wasn't built to build muscle 365 days a year, you know, 24 seven, which people try to do. And yes, they are genetic outliers that can do a lot of things and get by a lot of stuff and all they're growing and progressing, yes. But you can also make the argument, maybe they could do better, they can progress more. Um, they would have less injuries or, you know, whatever it may be. So you're always gonna have this kind of back and forth in this industry with my way's better, your way's better, whatever. You know, we all have our own, you know, methods and philosophies on what we think is best. Um, and I just don't like the argument when you are throwing the genetic elite in the mix. Because I'm sorry, I've trained them, I've been with them. <laughs> they can get by with doing a lot of wrong things and still look phenomenal. And I'm not going to argue with them because guess what? They're still progressing and, and making progress. So, you know, my hat's off to them to, to keep doing what they can keep doing to progressing. So I'm not going to tell them not to do that. But I still think for the majority of the population, you know, as normal people, we need to do this kind of stuff to get the most out of our training and periodize these things in, you know. And that's where, like, we talk about, like, deep loads would come in and bring those into periodization because i think deloads 
are kind of misrepresented in, in the industry as well. Um, in the sense that when you hear the word deload, people kind of automatically think low intensity, low volume, um, and, and just kind of rest, right? Or, or kind of like sometimes it's like do nothing at all. It's like just take time off, um, which absolutely has its place. But deloading is a lot more than that. So maybe if we're training for hypertrophy, or let's, let's go another route. If we're training for, we're in a strength-based phase like neurological type training, high intensity, heavy, heavy loads. Um, you can deload from that by going to more kind of metabolic stress type training, right? So we're obviously going to be using submaximal loading, higher repetitions, and shorter rest periods, which is the complete opposite of doing strength-based stuff. But you, the problem is, it's getting somebody to get on the same page with you. You tell a strength athlete or somebody's training for strength, okay, we're going to do some metabolic work uh, uh, and get out of this phase for, you know, maybe just a week, maybe two at the most. It's just psychologically hard for them. It's like, well, I'm going to lose my strength gains or I'm going to lose my progress, which couldn't be further from the truth because, again, there's a ceiling effect with everything. You, you just can't keep getting stronger. And there's other systems that you're not training during the neurological or strength-based stuff. So there's other energy systems that aren't being trained, right? You're not being efficient uh, with your recovery uh, because you have those longer rest periods. So like, say we go into more metabolic or conditioning-based stuff that's going to improve mitochondrial function, your your ability to recover between sets. Uh, so you're kind of like upregulating those systems and then letting the other systems just rest. When you go back doing strength, your recovery is going to be better. You're going to be able to push harder. You, you, you have basically resensitized your body to the strength-based stuff, and you'll get more out of it. So it's like deloads are, are a great way to potentiate the training that you're doing, right? So again, it doesn't have to be low intensity, so to speak, as far as effort or RPE, because metabolic training, like conditioning is freaking hard. I mean, you're gassed, you don't want to do any more lactate buildup, whatever it may mean. It's hard training. Um, and I would argue it's harder in a sense than strength-based training for sure, because you're just, just, just dead tired at the end of it, right? Um, so your, intent, your, your effort and RPE is still pretty freaking high. You're just, you know, not taking the loading so hard, but so you're also deloading your joints, you're deloading the nervous system, and all those things are getting fresh, and then we can jump back into it and just progressing. And this is the kind of the outlook that you want for everything, right? It's just, again, it depends on your primary goal, what you're trying to train for, that's the big picture. But we need to break that down a little bit, and okay, we can periodize these little short stints of phases. And like the metabolic, you could do that for a week. And that could be enough for a lot of people. And then let's jump back into strength-based stuff. And if it's hypertrophy, you know, it's just get away from that type of stimulus. And you could jump into neurological work or even metabolic stress and then go back into hypertrophy. The tricky thing there can be is, is especially if you're using like a metabolic stress, is with hypertrophy because there is that overlap and we're trying to get away from that as much as we can and not do the kitchen sink method where you're training everything at once. Um, it's just make sure there's not really a lot of overlap there. So if you were doing, you know, more sarcoplasmic type work for your high pressure training and it's more local, you know, you're doing triple sets or supersets with the same muscle group and whatnot. Maybe you go into um, the deload of doing metabolic work of just systemic based stuff. So you're pairing, you know, a bigger muscle group and a, and a smaller muscle group, like, like quads and biceps, right? So it's not so locally demanding. So it's, you're getting away from that local stimulus. So it's not that much of an overlap, but you're still getting that conditioning effect out of it. So it's just, it's just looking at these little nuances and getting as much out of training as possible. And, you, and if you get really good at it, you can throw in those deloads or those other types of uh, stimulus right before you start, you know, kind of going downhill with progress, before you start having those joint problems or injuries and whatnot. And you can kind of, okay, let's go ahead, let's, 
let's, let's do this little short deload for a week or two, and then let's let's keep going. We can keep pushing. So guess what? That's less time that you're having to do deloads, like the lower, you know, not like the no intensity time off stuff. Um, so you can keep working towards your goal more efficiently instead of getting to the point where my, my knees are killing me, my elbows are killing me, I'm just tired all the time, you know, all this, and then you just have to take time off. There's no way around it, which I do believe everybody during the year needs to take time completely off from the gym. You, you need to get out of that environment, again, because your body does need a break, not just your body, but your organs, your liver, all these things that are getting, get, that are getting stressed out doing this type of training, regardless of what type of training it is, you need to be able to get out of the gym and rest uh, and, and deal from the gym, right? The, the mentality, because people are so uh, kind of obsessed in a sense to where if you ask them to take time off from the gym, they freak out or, or they stress out of, oh my God, I'm going to lose all my gains. I'm going to get fat or whatever it may be. And that's not good either. You shouldn't get all stressed. That should be a time that you're relaxing and de-stressing and be able to get away from that. Um, I mean, you look at even the top league guys in, in sports, in any sport, whether it's football, basketball, or bodybuilding, they take actual time off from the, you know, their endeavor or what they're doing. Basketball players take a week or two, sometimes three. The, the top-end bodybuilders will take two and three weeks off in a row sometimes. Um, so that needs to be put in there as well. Um, and I like to do it throughout the year at points for people. No. So, so the the load you you check like the um, the type of stress you put on the muscle and on the system, and then you choose to uh, to deload from that type of stress. So there's no uh, one way to deload. No, that's like uh, like we yeah exactly. So like, like, go ahead. Like uh, like we used to uh, to hear like you need to uh, keep the intensity high and drop the volume for a deload. Uh, that's something I, I've heard uh, a lot. So uh, that may not be the best case for uh, like physique, uh, physique development. Yeah. So again, that's the thing is like people have a, a, a one track mind or think there's just it's a black and white on this is how you deload. There's no other ways to deload. So that, I always ask the question, well, why are you deloading and what are you trying to deload? It's not just deload and It's just don't train hardly at all, keep your intensity low, or just take time off. That is one type of deload, but it is not the be-all, end-all, and there's way more to it. Because a lot of people would rather just keep training towards their goal instead of having to take the time off or you know not train hard in the gym. Um, so I, I've found it to where I can push people longer without having to actually take the full time off. Typically... I would say I would give I like to give people like a full four to seven days off from training. A, obviously, training age comes into play here too as well. Newbies as opposed to somebody like me that's been doing it for a long, long time. About every four months or so, take time off, rest, take a break. Okay, let's jump back in it. And mentally, it keeps them fresh. They don't get burnt out at all. Their body feels so much better because they are able to push it when they go back and they just almost have this kind of like super compensation type effect because everything is just reset and it's just fresh and like, all right, we can hit the hammer, hammer again and start pushing the envelope when training. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's this, people just need to kind of think outside the box sometimes and get out of what's typically said in the industry. Mm. And uh, what do you, uh, how do you measure like progress in the, in uh, your your phase and also how do you measure that the people need the load or time off yeah so like measuring progress that's going to also be dictated by the, the the type of training you're doing right so if we're obviously for training for strength we want progression and that we absolutely want progression and load it's not going to be in every lift but we're going to have those primary movements well yeah we want to increase um the amount that you're lifting each week in said lift whether it's two pounds or 10 pounds or whatever it may be. So you can look at that as, okay, we're progressing in low pretty consistently here. And I will say strength-based stuff, you can stay in those phases typically longer than any of them because it's just also not as much mechanical damage or anything on the tissue, lower rest periods or higher rest periods and whatnot. So 
recovery is a little better on those. Um, but when you, you look at it and it's like, this is where you get to know the individual. So like typically it's like, okay, you get to week five on this phase, they've been progressing. Oh, they, they're kind of plateauing, you know, strength has been the same for a week, maybe two. Uh, okay. Um, and at that point, honestly, I'd be like, okay, let's, let's deload you for a week. Let's not take this chance and push you and uh, overreach you for the most part in this phase. So let's back off for just a week. And then let's re reestablish everything and then let's jump right back into this. OK, um, and like I said, for strength based stuff, I, I've seen you can typically push that longer than any of them. Now, with the hypertrophy stuff, I will do those honestly for like eight to 12 week stints. But with a, like a one week, like the, the back off of a completely different stimulus that doesn't overlap. So if we're doing like mechanical damage type stuff. It's like, okay, let's do a lactic acid based phase in here or an a, people call it AMPK or lactic acid, whatever you want to call it, but just a metabolic stress for just a week, prime everything, get the, get your glucose uptake into a good spot. You know, nutrient partitioning is improved during that phase. You are lower in inflammatory during those phases as well, as long as you're not pushing, you know, oxidative stress to where you're doing like triple or giant sets and stuff like that. Um, and then let's go back into the hypertrophy. So it's like, I'd rather stay ahead of the curve and, and, and just error on the side of keeping recovery as high as I can instead of pushing that envelope to where we're teetering right there to where we're really going to start digressing a lot. And then we need to deload for a little bit longer period than I'd like. Right. So that is the assessment of you can look at people's sleep because their sleep will probably get worse. Sometimes the digestion gets thrown off. Um, uh, irregular bowel movements, they can get a little bit of constipation. Uh, so it's looking at those factors. Like that's why when you have people send check-ins, you see all that other stuff. It's not just numbers. How are they feeling? You know, if the sleep goes to crap and you have irregular bowel movements and you're getting bloat and all this stuff, your body's probably pushing that envelope. Okay. It's not recovering that well. The stressors are going up and creating more and more inflammation in the system. So we need to back that off and correct those things. Because the last thing you want is for your sleep to get even worse and for digestion and your gut health to get worse, because then you're asking for a, a, a big uphill battle to get back out of those. And that's, and that's very common nowadays is, you know, the gut obviously issues that are out there nowadays. So, yeah, I mean, I like to, like I said, I like to, to stay ahead. I like to be safe and then break, take little shorter breaks when I need to, to make sure we are staying on in, in the right path. Because what's the worst that's going to happen? You're increasing your recovery capabilities. There's nothing detrimental to that, mm -hmm. right? Instead of now, I will say there are stents to where we would plan an overreach to where I am pushing your body like hard, uh, infl high inflammation, all this stuff. And you should start feeling a down uh, regulation and all these things. Like, yeah, your sleep's going to get worse. You're going to feel a little crappy. That's what we're going for. And I will typically have them take time off after that. So we're overreaching. Let's take, you know, four to seven days off. And then we're coming back because during that time off, you know, you're getting that mitochondrial biogenesis and all these things that are upregulating during the time off to so compensate, boom, right back into training, start progressing. It. And do you use, uh, I know you use a little bit of biomarker for yourself, like uh, blood glucose and everything. Do you use that on client also? Yeah. Um, the ones that are comfortable with it, like, the blood glucose obviously you're sticking pricking your fingers and stuff and some people they just don't like needles right so um i i more people are are coming around to that um just if you explain to them what what you were trying to see out of it um i have no problem with competitors doing it but if i see things that are off and just something isn't right i'm like we need to check this we need to see where like your your how your body is utilizing these glucose is it stabilizing thing is it just staying elevated all the time because Something else, there's a bottleneck in here somewhere that we're, that we're missing. So we need data to see where that's at. And, you know, sometimes with high um, blood glucose levels, if they're not coming back down, you know, like you'll see some people that are really good fasted numbers and then postprandial, their, their numbers are still high. Even three hours post meal, that's not good. But then you see sometimes the reverse to where it's high in the morning, but then after the meals, it's fine. So th those are two different scenarios and two different types of things that need to be fixed. Um, 
So, you know, those things are important when you're when you're not getting the progress you want out of a client and they're getting these standstills and these these massive plateaus like we need more data. I mean, that's the only way that you can move along is getting quantitative numbers to work with. If not, you're literally just guessing all the time. And when you're getting things like with gut issues and stuff, yeah, we'll always try lifestyle factors and throwing some supplements in there to try to correct them. But if this stuff is not working, you have to get tests done. Because people ask me that all the time. What can I do with my gut? This, 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 and this. Well, if these basic things aren't working, you're literally just kind of hoping something will work. You need to find out what the actual root cause is. And the only way to do that a lot of times is you have to get tested, which sucks because some of the tests are expensive, um, especially gut tests. Them things are insanely expensive. So that's why we want to take the biomarkers, take biometrics, to try to stay ahead of the curve, you know, obviously things like your blood pressure, your waking heart rate, those are very simple things to track. It's not, you know, invasive at all. And I don't see an issue. If a client is not willing to take their blood pressure or their waking heart rate, that tells me a lot about them. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's probably going to be a big headache to work with. I, I just don't think this is going to work in our coaching relationship. And you have to do that as a coach sometimes. Because the last thing I'm gonna do is to spike tooth and nail to get somebody to take their blood pressure. That's mm -hmm. he is ridiculous. You're coming to me as a for you know for help and to improve your own health, but yet you won't do these little tests to see where you're at health wise. Because a lot of times people, I'm not stressed. Well, okay, let's see what your waking heart rate is, your blood pressure. Waking heart rate's like 80, and their blood pressure is 140 over 90. Well, yeah, you're pretty freaking stressed. <laughs> I mean, when you just put the numbers in front of their face and that kind of has the light bulb go on their head. Okay, yeah, I'm actually stressed. But they don't think that sometimes because that's their life. That's what's normal to them at that point in time. So you have to get those numbers to kind of, here, this is, this is, this, this is facts. This is your numbers. We're not, you know, me just saying this. Um, so it's a good way to get compliance from some clients. If they'll start tracking the data and uh, getting those numbers for you because then you can explain to them why we're doing what we're doing. If like, you know, we need to do a, a lot of aerobic work initially to improve your aerobic capacity, to improve the blood pressure and waking heart rate, okay? We need to do this for this reason, then we'll get away from it. But the more context you can give a client and get behind things like that, the better their adherence is going to be. Because that's what it's all about. If, if they don't adhere to something, it's it doesn't matter what you say to them you know it's just going to be an uphill battle a constant battle and you know it's been unfortunate i've had to let clients go before because they just won't do any work so it's like when you first interview them, it's like yeah they're all gung-ho and yeah i'll do this 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 and this then two months in they're not doing anything and it's like you're wasting your time my time and your money so it's just pointless and do you use uh, also HRV uh, for uh, reading, uh, like uh, uh, recovery and everything? Um, HRV is one of those things. It's if they have the tools with them to make to, to measure, like an aura ring or you know their the our heart rate strap. Which you know if you if you do your waking heart rate and you use the heart rate strap, you can have apps that will track their HRV. And you know it's already in the same uh, mm -hmm. app, so it's easy. And I will get the number from them. I don't use it as the be all end all. I think there's too much variance still with it um it's just not honed in because they're giving these general generalized numbers of this is good this is kind of bad uh, and i honestly seen so much skewing on those numbers it's like uh yeah i just i don't agree with them sometimes i think you can use them um just looking at trends and just seeing the number in general and seeing if it's going up and or down i don't think the be all end all is the exact number mm -hmm. right because some people are going to be great on like a, an HRV of 60. When, if you look at the data and, and some of the research out there, it's like, okay, optimal is going to be like 80 ish or more. And then bad is like, you know, if you're under 60. Um, and I've seen both ends to where everything from blood work to the other, all the other biometrics are absolutely fine. But that one number is off. And a lot, honestly, and I've talked to people, it can be a, a psychological thing that's throwing it off. So I use it. I just don't use it as the be all end all as a lot of people. And, you know, if you want to use it, that's fine. But I don't think if you wake up and you have a bad HRV, that doesn't mean you shouldn't train that day, which people will do a lot of times. 
You know, it's just a snapshot of that one instant in time. It doesn't show you the bigger picture. Um, so again, it's, 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 a, it's a tool that's, that you can use, but use it appropriately and use it with context with everything else. Don't use it in isolation in and of itself. And um, uh, before you talk about the, the different phase on, uh, in periodization, you have like, uh, you said the string phase, you can use it longer. Um, you have like a trend that you use, like maybe uh, uh, like hypertrophy more uh, tension base, you will do like four weeks. Do you have like some some uh, guideline that you use or you always uh, keep track on your clients and then make adjustment? Yeah, I mean, it, again, it's just keeping track of their ability to recover, right? So the recovery is the, the key is like you don't want things to get to a point to where recovery is below your, your training threshold, right? So like you have to have that little gap to where there's always that little bit of recovery left over uh, so you can optimize things. Um, I've seen trends as far as, you know, how kind of how long some people can typically stay in certain types of training. Um, like, like with mechanical damage, if that's like a primary focus and you're like hitting that hard, um, cause that's a ton of inflammation on the system. Um, yeah, that's kind of, kind of be shorter than if you're doing more kind of volume tension based work, um, because of obviously the damage to, to the tissue, but then you have like things that are basically things that are higher inflammatory, like the really high inflammation types of training are done shorter periods, mm -hmm. right? And the other ones can be prolonged a little bit more uh, for sure. But I wanted people to understand too, like if you're designing a training program and like your, your, your basis is like, okay, I want to do a kind of a, a mechanical damage type phase. That doesn't mean every, every body part you train has to be uh, emphasized with mechanical damage, right? Because that is a lot. If you're, if you're doing that for every body part that you have, that's a very taxing on the system. And I typically will not do that. So I will pick out, depending on the client, you know, certain body parts that, that we're really trying to hit hard and bring up, uh, chest, quads, biceps, right? That's what we're going to kill with mechanical damage. And then the other things, we're going to do more, a little bit more volume, frequency, uh, like tension-based stuff on that. So you can kind of look at, kind of like a, a, a hybrid type, you know, training stimulus that you're putting people in when it comes to like hypertrophy type stuff. And then that goes, that goes for, you know, some of the neurological like strength based stuff too. It doesn't have to be just all sets are going to be sets of, you know, three to seven or something like that. You can do that as a basis, but you can throw a little bit of volume in the strength based you know, stuff, volume meaning like instead of doing five reps, you're going to maybe do eight, eight to 10 on a few movements and that's okay. Right. So there's ways to integrate these things to where it's not the kitchen sink method and you're doing everything. Cause you'll see some people, we're going to do five reps on this. Then we're going to do eight to 10 on these. Then we're going to do 15 to 30 on this exercise all in the same day. And it's like, that's, that's a little overkill. Yeah. And that's hard to recover from. I mean, some people can get away from, from short periods of time, newbies, obviously, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not a great way to be going about your training because yeah. people like that because it's hard, right? Like they're getting that massive pump at the end and the lactic acid and all that stuff, which, yeah, it's okay. But if you're doing your neurological stuff too, at the beginning, you're, you're overtaxing your body and it does not need that much to create the stimulus to adapt and improve. Uh, I was listening to uh, Mike Israel uh, on the podcast yesterday, and he was telling that when you use too much stuff, like uh, five rep at the beginning and 10 and 30, uh, they overlap their, themselves, like you said, but he said that it also cancel some of the effects. So you you make more during your workout. You think you make more, but like mm -hmm. the I, I rep stuff cancel the, the effect of the... Uh, on a little little bit cancel the effect on the uh, neurological stuff so yeah so basically i mean you're you what you're doing is you're tanking your recovery yeah yeah the training session felt awesome and hard and grueling yeah but you're you're also die you know dipping into that recovery capacity that you have and you keep doing that and it gets lower and lower and lower mm. so your recovery gets in the shitter and you dig yourself into this deep freaking hole that you got to try to dig yourself back out of at some point What's the point of that? So it's like, again, we always want to try to keep progression at the forefront and keep progressing. 
Now, obviously, there are times where the body is going to plateau. It's going to be in stagnation, and that's good. I mean, you cannot linear progress in anything. It's, it's physiologically impossible. Um, so people also need to be okay with those periods where, I don't want to say maintenance, but it is in a sense that your body weight may, may, may not change. You may not be getting stronger or anything like that. It's just kind of like your body's hit this point. We've gained as much as we can. Now we need to kind of settle in here to this new level, create a new set point, and then we'll build again from there. So there's going to be times where, yes, it's just like a stagnation period, right? And that this, that's just part of this whole process. So people's got to be mentally okay with that because sometimes people get crazy and they want to always chase the scale or they want to chase the weights on the bar. They want to chase some type of number when in reality is, you know, the body just does not work in that way or people that are taking PEDs are just freaking going to push more drugs to get, I mean, it's just a diminishing effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to talk about the nutrition uh, side also that you uh, periodize your, uh, your uh, stress of training with some kind of nutrition? Yeah, so, well, it's just making sure that we have the, the, the nutrients available and the substrates available for the training that we're doing, right? So, now, so th this is a caveat in a sense that if you're in a caloric surplus, you should be fine with most things. There doesn't have to be this major shift in nutrition If you're in a building phase and like you're you're in a surplus and like say you're doing you know pure hypertrophy mechanical damage stuff which takes a lot of fuel to recover from right and you need all those nutrients protein amino acids everything doesn't mean if you go into a you know a strength based type stimulus to where obviously it's not glycolytic um, it's not very calorically uh, demanding to do those types of training doesn't mean you need to slash a thousand calories and bring your carbs down by 400 grams because you're doing that training you can modify it and i do to an extent like on like if they're doing that i would take away carbs from their pre-training meal because it can take away from the intensity and the focus obviously the neurological aspect of strength training and i'll pull down their carbs pre-training probably keep their fats or increase them a little bit um, and just move things around a little bit and maybe bring their carbs down some but nothing major and they may but at the same time I, I keep your calories the same and just make it up with protein or fats, right? So it's, it's small adjustments. If you're in a caloric surplus, it's smaller. It's very small adjustments, if at all. If at all. Doesn't mean it always needs to be done. Because if you have somebody that's got this insane metabolism, even though strength-based stuff is less calorically demanding, doesn't require the same energy systems, you shouldn't be cutting their calories because they need to utilize all. And that's actually a good period for them to start storing more. You know, because obviously other things are so demanding. And now, when you're in a caloric deficit, then it's going to be coming a little more to where you got to make sure you are covering your basis on those. Um, because obviously, we don't have all the readily available nutrients and tons of muscle glycogen already stored to make sure that we're doing those, those whatever system it may be. Um, so, I would say during a dieting phase or a, a deficit is where you have to watch the nutrition and the training a whole lot closer, um, especially somebody that's doing a contest prep, because you're going to get to a point to where I see people are doing a ton of metabolic type work, females especially, and they freaking have no carbs. It's like, that's what runs that type of stimulus. And if you do not have that, guess what your body is going to likely use to run that? amino acids it's going to you know go through gluconeogenesis your liver is going to break it down it's going to want to turn into glucose for performance uh, there goes your muscle tissue uh, so you need and, and obviously dragging up inflammation and stress on everything else so yeah you, you have to match those things if you're doing that type of training um so yeah in a deficit is where i say absolutely you have to be more prone to be able to change and modify things um uh, on demand more so than in a caloric surplus Right, uh, that definitely is a lot more important because I mean I see it all the time with my competitors. I'm I'm doing that with people right now. People, especially, they're getting very close to their contest. You know, like that one girl that was, her, her legs were just looking inflamed, and watery. Um, and to me, and then you know I talked to some other people, and it's just that's like the inflammation is way too high. It means her legs are because obviously they're typically doing a de decent amount of cardio at that point too, which is 
stress on the lower body. Uh, so I think people need to watch that too with people that are in a deficit, doing a lot of cardio and high volumes of leg training, not really a good, uh, uh, good things to be doing together simultaneously because that's, it's just going to create too much inflammation, which is going to make it harder for you to, for you to oxidize and burn off fat. So we shifted her into low volume, just higher intensity loading, lower body stuff. So her body could still recover from all the, the cardiovascular and obviously all the cardio that we were doing, but we kept the upper body the same. We kept the volume and stuff in the upper body as is because her upper body was phenomenal looking. Don't need to change that aspect. So we pulled volume way down on the lower body because at this point, anyways, it's about maintaining tissue. It's not, you're not building anything at that point. So we need to optimize recovery, pull the volume down, go into more strength neurological type uh, stimulus from the lower body. That way we can keep using the cardio and the diet to keep burning off the fat, right? So yeah, I, I, it's just look at whether you're in a deficit or a surplus and then make sure that you're matching things up accordingly. And for contest prep, um, I know you do already talk uh, in your uh, in the repost and everything that uh, you need to uh, to be ready before you start the prep. So what what are you um, what like maybe a biomarker or everything you look uh, if someone come to you and said I want to uh, to do a contest prep? Yeah, so I mean this is where I'm like I'm really anal with people when they they want me to prep them is like look. I would rather you work with me definitely before we actually start a prep mm -hmm. to set your body up to actually do the prep, right? And you'll get a lot of people that want to start. And honestly, it's it's smaller and smaller percentages that come to me and they're like, you know, 17 weeks out or 18 weeks out and they can jump right into a prep because there's all kinds of other shit that's going on that's wrong with them, right? That we have to correct them. If you are not ready to start a contest prep right now, um, and a lot of and some of them like, okay, well, I'll just go to another coach that will say yes and then <laughs> start prepping. Right. So that is what it is. And some of them will listen and we'll we'll adjust things and then we'll put a pick a later date for a competition. Uh, but, yeah, you have to your body has to be. In a, so the off season should be a time period to where you are setting your body up to be able to handle the stress of a contest prep, because it, it, I mean, prep is not healthy. OK, just that's just the fact of it all. Um, so you need to set your body up to be able to handle those stressors and those acute periods of time to where you are pushing the unhealthy portion. You know, you're taking your body to an unnatural state. So it needs to be ready to handle that and not basically fight you, you know, every step of the way um, and cause more damage long term. So maximizing things. So like you, your, your blood pressure needs to be 100 percent optimal. Your blood glucose insulin sensitivity needs to be 100 percent on point. Your waking heart rate needs to be 100% on point. Digestion absolutely needs to be 100% on point. You need to be sleeping like a baby. You need to be having regular bowel movements, like no issues. You, your body needs to be primed to be able to handle what you're going to do. And that does not mean that prep is going to be easier. It just means prep is going to be more fluid and efficient. And you're going to get to the end product a lot, you know, without having to go to insane extremes to get there. So it's just like, we got to prep, prep the body and then be able to do this. Cause I've seen people do it and I have had clients that they have to push the, I mean, they have to push hard to get to that stage condition, but we've done all the homework beforehand and their body handles it just fine all the way up until the show. Uh, I had a guy, I have a guy that's competing this weekend and you know, I'd worked for him for two years and then we were just doing a dieting phase. I was like, okay, I want to do a prep or I want to do this show. It's like seven weeks away. Do you think we can do it? If I hadn't worked with him previously to know what we, we've been doing, I would have said no. But I knew that his body could handle what we had to throw at it in seven weeks time. And he dropped, you know, he's down 12 pounds in like four-ish weeks um, and pushing, pushing, pushing. And regular bowel movements, blood glucose is fine. Blood pressure is absolutely fine right now. And there's no bad uh, markers as far as recovery, you know, and he's in a great place. He just feels like shit, which, and, and, you know, your stage yeah. ready. want to feel like crap. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, but it, yeah, you have to prepare the body. And I, you just see it all the time that people, they jump into a contest prep because they want to look a certain way uh, and they have not done their homework. And then it just cat and it, it kind of snowballs into something bad. And then it's literally after the competition that it gets even worse. 
And it's like, oh, geez, man, now, now we're going to have to spend the next two months trying to just fix you before you can actually start, you know, working towards building muscle again. Like and that. during the uh, the contest prep, do you have like uh, you talk about high volume work that uh, if you don't have like a little bit of carbs, it don't work as well. Uh, do you have like um, like a style of uh, workout to use or a lot of cardio in the beginning, uh, in the end, or just keep uh, increasing both? Or uh... that's kind of like a mindset thing, like when it comes to uh, do we take more food? Do we add more cardio? Right? Because You honestly will have some people that would rather diet their ass off and not do as much cardio. And then you'll have some people that rather do a shit ton of cardio and eat more food. Right. So you, you got to kind of get the psychological part of that. So what, what's the client thinking? What, what are they mentally okay with? Because if you can get on the same page with them there, they can push harder in whichever direction you go because they're like, okay, I'm fine. I can do, you know, 70 or 60 minutes of cardio every day, but I get to eat more food. So I'm, I'm willing to do that. No problem. We have people like, well, I do not want to get up and do 60 minutes of cardio every day. So I'd rather push my food down a little bit more. And then there's the balance, obviously, of the two, because, yeah, I mean, at some point, food is just going to get low and cardio and the cardio thing is just individual. I mean, I have people that have done none. I've had people that's done 75 minutes in a day. I mean, it's just so back. And I've had people that it's different every prep on how their body responds. Um, so I, there's just no one method. And I think people or coaches that kind of will kind of fall into that rut is like, well, a lot of my people are doing a lot of cardio and this kind of method to get ready for a show. So I'm going to put everybody on that and hope they progress. You can't do that. You, you, you mean, it has to be just an assessment, constant assessment of, what their body is able to recover from and handle. And guess what? If they're stalling out and they're hitting this wall a lot, the last thing you need to be doing is adding more to that. That typically means you need to do a 180 from what the hell you're doing, get away from that uh, type of stimulus or training or cardio and, and do something else because the, your body is just like, it's not having it. But people don't do that. They, they'll typically just continue to slash more calories and continue to add more cardio when sometimes you need to do the complete opposite or you're doing all this metabolic type high volume training. Like, hey, let's how about a slash that volume in half and just up the intensity and let your body recover. Uh, right. I mean, there's just there's there's many avenues that you can go to adjust. And it's just the assessment of it to get a client to their best possible you know, outcome in the end. And how do you view the uh, post-workout, uh, post-workout, post-contest, uh, like nutrition and training-wise? With my clients, if they've been with me and we've been doing things for a while and, you know, we went through prep, um, like the guy I talked about, I know what his body can handle. We, we're in a good place. We have His health is, for the most part, obviously fine, besides his body fat being low. We will jump into pushing uh, uh, the rebound, so to speak. And the problem that people hear me talk a lot on other podcasts and being like, like a lot of people need to just focus on getting health back to a good place and recovery. It's because they've done stupid shit and they're in, in the tank. Now, if there is, if you've periodized well and if you've done your homework and your body's in a good place, I absolutely think you can jump out of those preps and stuff. And yes, you can go into a great rebound period, structured obviously, and, and, and accrue a good amount of tissue after that if your body is in a healthy spot to do that. So is your blood pressure good coming out of the prep? Is, is your blood glucose good? You know, is all these things, all these biometrics and stuff, are they in a good spot? If they are, guess what? We can jump into whatever to start pushing. If not, the first thing that we're going to do is maximize your health and then go from there. And uh, what's your favorite uh, supplements to use? Uh, like you can talk about health wise, Uh, off season and then uh, like uh, pre contest. Um, I mean, I have my bases that I that pretty much I give everybody for the most part. Um, like you're always like going to do a multivitamin, multi mineral. Uh, make sure too, like with those that the mineral, the, the multivitamin stuff are like uh, chelated forms. You know, like the ones that are attached to amino acids, just because you're going to get better absorption with those instead of some of the shit ones that are out there. And it, it looks cool on the bottle, but if they're not the chelated forms, you know, your absorption is going to be kind of shit. 
Um, so those, um, I, I honestly, and some people, this is the back of board, depending on the person you talk to, but I like the powdered greens for people to use. I like to say as a buffer, because, you know, especially if you're in a caloric deficit, you're just not going to get the amount of micronutrients, uh, the phytonutrients, I should say, you know, polyphenols and all those things to cover your basis because food get, does get low to a point. Uh, I like those just in there just in case, because I'd rather a little bit too much of that than not enough mm. because then you're asking for trouble. Um, so a powdered greens, um, then for, for a lot of people, vitamin D3 and K uh, combo product, obviously you need the K in there to help get the most out of the vitamin D. Um, obviously the amount of sun exposure is going to dictate that as well, but I also like people if they can to get tested and to see actually where their vitamin D levels are. Um, and then uh, omega threes, absolutely, are always in there. <clears throat> With the omega threes, um, just make sure you don't buy the cheap forms because they are very. I mean, if you get the cheap, they, they oxidize easy and they can go rancid, right? And then if they're rancid, they're doing more harm than good when you put those in your body. So when you go cheap on supplements, a lot of times you're gonna you're gonna get the repercussions with that because they're cheap for a reason. Um, and then like. You can look at the ratio of the omega-3 in the person. So, right, if somebody's like uh, high inflammation and whatnot, you're going to go for a more higher EPA uh, dosing uh, ratio to the DHA. And if somebody's brain fog or cognitive function is lower, we're going to go more DHA uh, because that's, that's what it benefits. So you look at the ratio sometimes, um, what the person's going through and what they kind of need as far as those things are concerned. Um, then on top of that, honestly, I don't get crazy with supplements um, unless it's like a, a health thing that we need to cover. Um, creatine is always in there. I mean, that's that to me, that's like a no brainer. I mean, it's the freaking most studied supplement on the market. You know, there's no bad to it. Um, so I always, always have creatine and I honestly always have glutamine in there as well. Um, more so for the gut, obviously to improve the gut lining, keep it healthy, but it also helps. You can help during training with, rid in the body of ammonia that you're producing during training as well. Um, so the creatine and glutamine I like, those are our bases that I love for everybody to have. Outside of that, I think during a surplus and or a deficit, like intra workout carbs are good in a sense, like in a deficit, because obviously your, your storage of glycogen is lower. Um, you need to fuel the performance that you're doing, and it's a buffer system. So you're going to maintain that anti-catabolic effect during training. You know, people are, I think people mis, just misuse the terminology a lot of times because all, they'll always say anabolic during training, or I'm taking the aminos and the, the carbs to be anabolic. You cannot, you can't be two pathways at once, right? Uh, you're going to be one or the other. You're going to save your anabolic uh, pathways and stuff post-training, to when you're recovering that's you can't be in recovery mode and train at the same time that it, that's redundancy it doesn't work that way so i think people are just saying anabolic just because it's been settled so many times uh, with intro workout stuff and you're not anabolic okay you're just anti-catabolic so it's making sure that we have the fuel there to perform um the substrates there and then that we aren't tapping into you know amino acids and whatnot to run uh, the system obviously if you don't have the glucose readily available so i like intra workout during a deficit um, to an extent to make sure we do have that anti-catabolic effect during a surplus it's like you know it's a great place to put calories in um is it an absolute not by any means i still like it but it's not that it, it, you have to have it because if you're in a surplus you should have enough stored glycogen in your body and you should be fine Drinking water is fine during her workout. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's more contextual, but I still like it. I still do put it in people's plans um, for sure. Um, and then... And what do you think about like uh, the uh, the AA versus BA debate on the... Like we see a lot of online that uh, people said that like BCA are not as effective as EA during workout, but then you said that you want to be anti-catabolic during workout, not... You can't be anabolic when you uh, when you're training. So yeah, so I think it's context that's being lost there, because so, it's always the argument is like, 
essential aminos are, are better for protein synthesis, you know, turn on mTOR and all that stuff. A hundred percent agree. BCAAs do a shit job at doing that. So BCAAs for recovery, like that aspect are, 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 you can say they're garbage compared to essential amino acids, a hundred percent. But again, let's look at the context of it. Let's look at intro. What is the goal intro? It's to have that readily, that available fuel source to create that anti-catabolic environment, right? So we can keep training and keep our performance levels up. BCAAs do that just fine during that because we're not trying to be anabolic, right? We're just trying to provide fuel for our systems. Um, so, I mean, can you use EAAs during the workout? Sure, I'm not saying you can't use, you can't use them, but when people say BCAAs are garbage, in that context of intro workout, I think are being misled because, again, it's the contextual aspect of what is it being used for. You are not using, uh, you're not trying to use branch chains to be anabolic during the during training session. You're using them as a, as a fuel source. That's it. And so essential amino acids are not more, are, are, are better assimilated or better absorbed as a fuel source as opposed to branch chains during, during a workout. So I just think people need to kind of get on the same page and what they're talking about in context with that. So I would say the only place, in my opinion, for branch chains, if you're going to use them, is going to be during the workout for fuel. Other than that, absolutely no use whatsoever. Now, and again, essential aminos can be used during the training session. If you want to use essential aminos, more power to you. It's fine. It's not going to hurt you by any means. It's still going to be used, but it's still going to be used as a fuel source. It is not going to be used to make you more anabolic. I mean, you're not you're not breaking down and building muscle tissue at the same time. That's physiologically impossible. You're just not creating your creating this deep hole that you're digging yourself into to recover from. You're just maintaining that anti-catabolic effect. So again, I think context is lost a lot when it comes to that subject. And for contest prep, do you have like favorite uh, supplements that you use uh, for for you or for clients? Uh, other than what I've listed, no. I mean, unless you're going the route of do we add supplements in for you know to improve fat oxidation or you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely little go tos that that I would like to add in with some people, but some people just don't want to take other supplements, right? Uh, but I like I, I would say during a prep is getting things that will help calm the nervous system down, uh, help to keep cortisol in balance, um, more so than anything, because obviously the stress on the body goes up higher and higher. So you can, things like L-theanine um, can be used in erotorine a little bit more, uh, products on the market. There's tons of products that uh, ad adaptogens, obviously, um, as well. And again, it's just enhanced recovery and to keep the stress response in balance obviously we still need it but a lot of people like it goes to the extreme and especially with the uh, increased consumption of caffeine and stimulants and all that stuff i mean it's, it's very taxing on the on the systems so we need to kind of balance that out as much as we can uh with when you can do that with supplementation you know and i do that the final week with my competitors because anxiety is usually high stress is usually freaking high um so i'm gonna do what i can supplement wise to help mitigate that because you can tell them to you're blue in the face to relax and calm down and breathe and doesn't make it go away I, i've just seen it too many times uh, so i just implement supplement strategies to help them balance that out and uh, post contest do you use like some some kind of uh, supplements to uh, like just uh, make sure everything is okay uh, or is it the same stuff uh, that you use it's the same stuff but i would look more towards Uh, things that's going to uh, things that will like feed things that have been downregulated. So like their thyroid, right? I mean, during mm -hmm. dieting, it, it, it downregulates. So you want to basically support thyroid. So the things that will support thyroid function, um, obviously iodine, selenium, all those th types of things. And there's there's good products out there that have a, a good combination of them, um, from Thorn and New Ethics and all those. Uh, then also something again to support the adrenals as well, because they you know, people have been pounding caffeine and stimulants and it's it tax it's taxing on the adrenals so you know like a bovine or something like that to help feed the adrenals and help them get back on par to where they were before you started the dieting phase and uh cool that uh that uh
it's a good answer for uh, um, for the supplements. And uh, my last question was, uh, who was your biggest mentors during your, the years, or uh, the best uh, certification maybe you have done in the in the 20 years that you've been done that? Well, best certification is easy. There obviously hasn't been any until like Cass and them came out with M1 because right? I've done them all, right? And I honestly didn't. I would well, I, I take that back. Like precision nutrition was was great foundation, mm -hmm. right? To learning to how to get clients to be compliant with the nutrition, how to manipulate things for lifestyle and, and whatnot. So I, I would definitely say precision nutrition is great for nutrition and to get you going uh, on basics of everything. Um, now, as far, as far as the training and application with clients and stuff like that, it's, it's me coming up, it's been a joke because I have been to every NSDA conference and ISSA, blah, 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 these, and you just get there and it's, it's nothing but research on top of research that, that there's just no real world application stuff. It's like, this is all great and good, but when it comes to the science and research, that's like control groups typically not the, the, the demographic you're working with. Um, it's just unrealistic things to look at. It, it, I mean, it's great to read on research and kind of get ideals, but it's not going to dictate how you work with people and how you, you know, kind of put the nutrition and training application together, understanding how the body works off different types of training stimulus. Um, so CAS developing in one is by far, hands down, the best out there as, as far as all encompassing. Now, I will say, like muscle nerves, Luke Lehman, um, he's, he's got, I mean, he's phenomenal too, as far as the body systems, you know, how they work and whatnot, um, how energy is produced, you know, digestion, all that stuff. He's phenomenal too. I mean, I've, took, I've taken all their courses. Um, so Luke's phenomenal uh, with that stuff too. And then you look at people like Brian Walsh, um, James Laval, when it comes to the gut health and, you know, all those, all those other entrants, like the functional medicine type, you know, route that people are going to now. I will say this is don't try to be an expert in everything. <laughs> you're yeah. going to, you're going to start going down rabbit holes. That's going to make it more confusing. Than it needs to be. I learn all these things, but I still, my, my kind of expertise and stuff is still, you know, the training and nutrition and recovery, right? I have these guys that I reach out to and go to and refer to a lot of times, like, like, like I'm speaking with James Laval now and looking at courses with Brian Walsh and all those, and I've taken obviously courses with Luke and, and Cass and stuff. Um, and it's learning more stuff, but don't make it overcomplicated for your freaking clients and thinking that you're an expert in functional medicine and you're trying to read all their blood work and thinking you can dis you know, distinguish what exactly needs to be done when you're not an expert in that. It's good to know. I mean, I can look at blood work and be like, okay, these markers are way the hell off. These need to be looked at. We can correct probably this for this, but you still need to kind of refer out to the experts, right? Don't think that you're going to try to fix people because you can mess them up just as bad thinking that you're an expert in that field. Well, I think people need to learn a lot of these stuff, but get your foundations good first. Became, become a good coach with training and nutrition and recovery. If you cannot master those, you have no business trying to be a functional medicine person or a gut expert or whatever it may be. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. and that's becoming an issue now because people yeah. are taking these uh, single weekend courses that deal with this and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm a certified I'm a functional medicine person. Oh my God, I mean, that's not even close. Yeah. Uh, I know this because talking to guys like Katz and Luke who are on another level when it comes to biochemistry is like, oh, I don't know anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, I'm lucky enough that I can go to those guys and, and can ask and, you know, get like, I don't know something. I go to them and I ask, I'm like, look, I'm stuck here. What, you know, what, what's the best route? What should I do? Blah, blah, blah. So be smart, refer out, go to yeah. other people that are experts in these other fields and try not to become an expert of everything. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, certifications is definitely going to be to me in one is the all encompassing. Um, and then as far as mentors, I mean, I've had a lot and they are not good by any means, but you still learn from them. You know what I mean? You kind of, you can always have some type of takeaway from anybody you're learning from, good or bad. Um, I, I, unfortunately, 
if I had to put percentages on it, I've had more bad than good. But it made me a better coach being like, I shouldn't, I mean, that's just stuff I shouldn't be doing because X, Y, and Z. Um, and so just take, take, a, take a lesson from whatever you, you're getting information from. And it's okay if you go down later down the road and like, well, that was just all bullshit. And it was ridiculous. Uh, that's okay. That was a learning experience. You understand that and you know why it is, right? Because people are taking social media influencers and stuff. They're taking the word as gospel. And thinking that because they have X amount of followers or very popular that what they say must be true. When in fact it is far, I mean, I, I've just seen it. It's, it's sad to see. Um, that's not at all. I mean, like, I mean, you do this shit, you're going to cause some dysfunction if you, if you do this. But, you know, all we can do is try to put out the good information and not hurt people because that's, that should be the, the end on is do no harm to anybody. So, don't speak on a topic that you're really not sure of and talking in somewhat absolutes because I'm seeing that too. There's no absolute and, and a lot of things. Now, there is our, they're all absolutes in physiology. Energy is made one certain way, right? You create ATP through certain pathways. That's it. There's, there's no way around that. Biomechanics. Yes, everybody has structure, different structures, different mobility and all that stuff, but there's still a general... Uh, uh, emphasis on how things should and should not be done with the you know people with the locking scapulas down and all this kind of shit that is going to cause issues and you're, you're going to feel things but you shouldn't be feeling but because people do feel things they think that's good but what they're feeling is you're probably like what the hell are you doing to me i shouldn't be doing this it's not a good type of you know feeling so to speak um so i mean i would say the, the most positive people that have influenced me and have helped me. Cass obviously is there by by far one of the, the best guys in the world that I know of. Um, he's just in a sense of putting things, connecting the dots, so to speak, between everything. So being an expert in, in with biochemistry, functional medicine, biomechanics, and all that stuff, and kind of connecting the dots between everything. Excellent at that. And putting it in a way that you can freaking understand and not so over your damn head. Um, so him, Luke, I've been friends with Luke for a while. He, he set me on a good path with certain things for sure. Um, and then I just have good people around me like Paul Carter, uh, great friends. We'll be seeing each other in Vegas. Um, John Meadows, friends with him, just all around good human being to everybody. Um, uh, so, I mean, those are probably the main people I would say that have influenced me in some way, shape or form in my career and continue to, I mean, I'm still, I'm friends with them all. But those would probably be the top people. Cool. And, um, where can uh, people find you online? Um, easier for me because I'm not the social media expert. So, uh, through Instagram, it's honestly, it's just my name, Alan Cress, um, underscore IVV pro. And then Facebook, it's just Alan Cress. Um, and then our website, is uh, maximumperformancetraining.net, which we're actually building more and more content for right now. So we're actually developing it to a place to where we'll have, you know, a diet builder for clients, and we're doing all of our check-ins through there because we have a new check-in system, uh, which is nice because it allows us to collect all their data when they do their check-ins, and when they do their check-ins and, and put all their information in each week, it shoot, shoots it over into a database that we we had this built for ourselves because so, people ask me like what 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 do you use and it's something we just had built for us personally it's not something we went and bought you know from somebody else so we had it built to where it shoots into a database for the client specific file and then it lines up all their their biometrics and trackers food notes everything so we can see the trending of all these things and assess them better um with all that so that's helped a lot with you know being very efficient uh with coaching Because, as you know, when you start coaching, it's overwhelming in a sense of keeping all this shit together and their data and what the client needs. And so if you can make that as efficient as possible, it makes you a better coach and it makes your life a lot better to where you're just not overwhelmed and working 70 hours a week all the time. Yeah. And you also have uh, your YouTube channel? <laughs> yeah. So YouTube is just Alan Crest Training. Um, I need to start doing that more. And we've been talking about it. now that we actually have the home gym built 
um, built up that we can actually start filming in here without disruption and distractions of filming in like a regular gym. Uh, so we'll actually start doing more content with that. I've actually, uh, hopefully it'll be going up soon. Um, I'm with Nutrex, obviously, for supplements. Uh, so I'm, I've been working with them for a couple of years. And now I've been shooting a lot of video content for them, talking about supplements, talking about even training um, and stuff. Um, so they're looking to put that up on their their website soon. Um, and I'll obviously talk about that on social media once they launch that. Um, and I'm excited for them because we're actually coming out with our uh, natural line of supplements now, uh, you know, that no artificial anything, sweet with stevia, monk fruit, all those things. Uh, so that's, it's nice to be a part of that as well. So excited about that. And then again, our seminars coming up, uh, and I know, you know, uh, Jake Carter. Yeah. Yeah. And the UK, yeah, so thank you. These two are likely going to be doing the seminar with, um, nice. over in Europe and possibly, you know, look to come here in the States, maybe Canada, um, uh, we're just trying to set all that stuff up and just coordinate all of it. Like with, especially with international stuff, it's kind of difficult. It's being done, but we hope to do start that around late October, early November, to start doing those uh, seminars, which will encompass everything from, it, we're actually basing it around uh, post-contest, pre-contest, or, or just post-diet, pre-diet, it doesn't have to be a competition, uh, periods for people uh, everything from body dysmorphia uh, to the food, to the training, to programming and all that stuff for that, you know, specific period where people have issues coming out of a dieting phase or what they need to be prepared for when they're going into a dieting phase. So we're trying to get, you know, honed in on something that's not really been uh, dealt with as far as seminars and that aspects. Like he'll touch on hormones and, you know, all that kind of stuff as well. So we're, we're trying to get all that put together right now. So hopefully we'll be able to start putting dates out pretty soon for it. Cool. So we can have you in Montreal also. Yeah, I, I, obviously I know people in Montreal. Uh, he actually does as well, which is nice. Uh, so yeah, I mean, at some point in time <laughs> we'll be yeah. coming around that way. Cool, cool. Uh, all right, and um, good. So uh, thank for uh, for your time uh, on our, our podcast. And, um, and yeah, I hope uh, we can have you uh, sometime more on the podcast. And uh, when, if you come to Montreal, you will announce it on uh, on social media, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, thanks for your time, Alan. All right, Jake. Donc, merci à tous d'avoir écouté. J'espère que vous avez apprécié. Si vous aimez ça, les podcasts, n'oubliez pas de laisser un petit review sur iTunes, un petit 5 étoiles. Ça nous ferait grandement plaisir. Si jamais vous avez quelqu'un que vous voulez avoir sur le podcast, vous pouvez nous écrire sur Instagram, Facebook, Quantum Training. Il y a aussi notre chaîne YouTube que vous pouvez aller voir, Quantum Training. Et aussi, pour ceux qui écoutent le podcast, vous avez 20% de rabais sur le site beliefsupplément.com avec le code QUANTUM20. Si vous voulez un shaker, incassable en acier inoxydable, pas de BPA. L'excellente compagnie Mana Apparel vous offre 15% de rabais avec le code QUANTUM15. Sur ce, passez une excellente journée et on se dit à la prochaine.